Okay, awesome. go ahead, Katu. I'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, the 130 session on inks, uh, looking back 50 years later. <clears throat> I'm going to be your moderator this afternoon. My name is Patuk Glenn. Um, I'm from Utrecht. My mom and dad are Richard and Arlene Glenn. And uh, I have the honor to introduce uh, Willie Hensley and Oliver Levitt, who have been uh, in many ways my heroes as someone that has studied history and self-determination. And I'm lucky enough to know them on a personal level. <clears throat> a little bit about me before we get started. I am on the Alaska Historical Society Board of Directors. I work for the Arctic Slope Community Foundation as executive director. I've spent time uh, working for our regional corporation, Arctic Slope Region, Regional Corporation as um, uh, community economic development project manager. I worked at our museum, local museum, history, language, and culture for Inupiat people, uh, where I, I mean, I got to know all of this stuff intimately, studying our history and understanding a little bit more in depth about our self-determination. And that's when I truly began to realize how big of rock stars that Oliver and, and Willie were and we're so thankful that they're still here with us today to tell their story. So now, so now a little bit about uh, Oliver. And, and he is actually Dr. Oliver Levitt. He's been given the title Honorary Doctorate uh, from University of Alaska Fairbanks. He has a whaling crew in Barrow. He's got um, many children and grandchildren. And he's had... Uh, his whole career started, you know, he came back from the Vietnam War and he came back to his community and, and they asked him to, to lead for him. And he was working, when he first came back for Arctic Slope Native Association, he was their treasurer. And so he was in those initial days of, um, the Alaska Federation of Natives, which helped lead into uh, the original agreement for ANCSA. And he, even when, uh, even after that, he was um, the AFN board member. He was one of many from 1971 to 1999. He was the chair from 1985 to 1986. Uh, uh, and then he even served as president of the North Slope Borough Assembly he served um, on our ASRC board of directors for many years, I think 20 plus years, may, maybe longer. Uh, he was the VP of external affairs. I mean, he's been able to negotiate many things for our region that uh, we, sh we all should be thankful for today. Now we also have Willie, you know, uh, Willie Hensley is from right next door. He's from the Nana region, from Kotzebue. And he's currently a, UAF, a UAA professor. He worked many years uh, in federal relationships for Nana. Uh, he, he also worked as, um, for the state as the commissioner of commerce. He's had 20 plus years in Nana. And he was an original founder of AFN. And he's got um, uh, five kids and, oh no, sorry, six kids and 12 grandkids. And so both of these guys, uh, I've read about in books, but I've been very lucky enough to know on a personal level, call them Adada or call even text. Now we're lucky enough, we got cell phone, we can text and, and connect sometimes. And they, they were um, gracious enough to allow me to bother them enough to speak to you guys today. And I, I, I know that uh, I may be missing some things from, from their introduction. I would like for them to kind of introduce themselves a little bit and talk a little bit more about who they are and their involvement was for uh, what we now have today as the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. And we're 50 years later, so if um, maybe we could start with 
with you, Oliver, talk a little bit about uh, who you are and, and a little bit about those initial days. And then we'll let Willie have a chance to talk a little bit about who he is. And then I want to make sure I, I play that, uh, that original audio of Nixon announcing that um, historic uh, landmark decision that made Inksa, because I think it's going to be really important for everybody that are listening to know more about how it was at that time, who you guys were at that time, and sort of the events that led to everything. That will be really cool to hear about. So I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm gonna go on mute, Oliver. Well, thank you, Patuk. That was kind of you to introduce us. <clears throat> Both Willie and I, started in with humble beginnings we didn't know much we had to go back to dc to find out what was going on what was being said about it uh, there was a lot of proposals and some of them weren't any good and we knew that And we still had to go and fend for ourselves about who we are, what we do, and why we believed in it so much. And I know that Willie is a good historian. And I love listening to him talk about himself, his, his own stories. And I suppose we all have our own stories, but Willis in, in particular is very good. And uh, so without much further ado, I'd rather just turn it over to Willie to listen to him talk about himself and what he did back then. Zara? No. <laughs> uh, I want to hear your story, Oliver, because I find yours more interesting because you know more stories of your part of the world than uh, anybody I've talked to. Um, uh, because I think what is important is to try to give the listeners some context of of how life was and in, in the uh, monumental uh, challenges that you had to face as well as the rest of us in terms of change and uh, actually comprehension of what the heck was going on. Uh, I, just, I just have this image of you, uh, you've told me about uh, uh, and <laughs> maybe when we were out whaling or something about, you know, I, I, I was I was a wood chopper too, you know, as a kid. I mean, we all had to do something. But I, I just have this image of you in your dog team out there going along the shoreline in the dead of winter, trying to see if there was a piece of wood sticking up so that you can stay warm at home. I mean, you talk about humble beginnings. I mean, that that's pretty much a, pretty much a, a story we've shared, I think. And I think people should hear that part, Oliver of your life because people don't know another time maybe <laughs> we we can we can get more into depth on that and i i do want all of the uh conference participants to realize that back in that time man in order to keep warm you had to go get driftwood when, when these guys were young men or children, they would wake up and there was uh, a, a, a pail of water and it was frozen. These guys, uh, they grew up in a different time than us. And it, it, is, it, it is probably even way different than what uh, Emo and uh, Sam Keto, because they're in the South in some ways, different aspect. These two guys, they grew up in the North and 
I mean, uh, right now we have Facebook, right? We have all these VHF and everything. In those days, the communication, what we had 100 times, and uh, we're lucky that there was Mount Edgecombe and these things to connect them all together, but they, they were awesome in what they did and how they did it and what little that they had to do it with. Um, I, I do want to maybe what, uh, Willie Oliver, would you guys mind if I played the video with uh, 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 Nixon's? Sure. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, let me see. <clears throat> and let, let me make sure my audio is shared. Okay, good. <clears throat> so uh, just to give you guys uh, listening a little bit more background information, this video was taken at uh, one of the first AFNs, but this was, I mean, they had multiple meetings, Alaska Federation of Natives. This meeting was right before they found out that Nixon was gonna announce the historic settlement deal. And I feel like this is such an important piece of history because you look around the room, you might see some familiar faces. Um, the first person speaking is Joe Opik Sound, that, that was a leader of our region. And he, he proposed some pretty radical things. The original video, I would encourage you to watch it. Um, we didn't always get along as very uh, all the regions of the state. However, we were able to get along long enough to come to this consensus. And, um, you know, in this year, I believe 1971, they were able to get Nixon to approve something, which it was no small feat. We can listen to this, but I would love to hear more from Oliver and Willie about what it took to get there. What was the time like? What was the feeling? What was all of this about? And, and, and what did you guys have to do to fight for even just getting this? So I'll play it and then we can talk. Make no mistakes of it. We, the Alaska Native, are being paid this so-called settlement for just one reason. Because we have legal rights. Ladies and gentlemen of the AFM, this is the White House in Washington calling. I present the President of the United States. I think we this opportunity to extend my greetings and best wishes to the Convention of the Alaska Federation of Natives. I want you to be among the first to know that I have just signed the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. A milestone in the last of history, and the way our government deals with Native and Indian peoples. So the institutions of government are with parties. And we saw this bill, my cousin Agnew and I were in close consultation with your president now. We have ably and vigorously represented you in the My congratulations go also to Senator Fred Stevens, to Wally Hickel, and to those of both parties. So my apologies, oh, the audio was a little bit kind of rough. I've been spending all morning trying to edit that audio to reduce the background noise. But I think that, um, I mean, just watching that, I know that I don't know if you, Willie, or Oliver were there at that time, but I imagine you may have heard it or you may have heard about it. What were your guys' feelings at the time that this was taken, taking place? I was there. Um, and uh, uh, you know, maybe before getting into uh, that particular in incident, uh, as important as it was, uh, 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 Karen Brewster and others were want wanting to know sort of what the uh, sort of the conditions uh, were like uh, back then. I'm not sure if she was talking about political conditions or social economic conditions, but uh, 
uh, I, I would say that um, uh, you know the 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 forties and fifties in the years that I was growing up, uh, you know, it was uh, we were still living off the land primarily. In fact, uh, I think our family was probably one of the last ones that actually lived in, in three different sod homes about 10 or 12 miles from Kotzebue. They were warm uh, in contrast to the tar paper shack we had in Kotzebue that didn't have enough insulation and had only one pane of window. But the reality was that we were pretty much staying alive like a lot of our people had done for millennia, really. Uh, we we're primarily living off the same fish and birds and caribou and seals and belugas and whole varieties of fish and ducks and geese and plants uh, that our people had survived on. And so, uh, you know, we, like, we could still go to the sod house, the remains of the last sod house I lived in as a boy. Uh, and uh, when you talk about humble beginnings, I mean, <laughs> you know, we weren't collectors of stuff back in those days. We just carried en enough stuff that we could move around and get by on because you know you had to carry it yourself or get it put it on your dog team. Uh, I mean, in those days, uh, there was absolutely no question in my own mind and, and then those of our people that this was our land. This had been our land for millennia, thousands of years. People were very, very intimate with the land. You know, I, I slept in the land, under the land, you know, and so those, uh, those early uh, impressions uh, stayed with me my whole life. I mean, every day, really. And uh, so we never in, in remotely thought that our, we, we would be uh, having to fight for that land, uh, you know, in the modern era, um, because it was simply unthinkable that this wasn't our land, okay? Um, and, uh, of course, the way I look at it, uh, uh, I'd like to actually thank the commission for, uh, actually conducting this, uh, this series because, uh, you know, maybe they're making up for lost time, but when I look back at the historical commission, uh, activities, their annual meetings, it was all about the pioneers, right? All about the, the, the native, we were not in the picture. And, and, I, and I'm not saying it was wrong. It was just their world that they were familiar with. They weren't involved in familiar with our world, the thousands of years of history, the stories, the art, the music, the knowledge. That wasn't their thing. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so, uh, and also, uh, uh, unless you under, we never understood colonialism, never even used the word, even as we were fighting for our land, I didn't have the slightest sort of idea of what, uh, was involved in that notion. Uh, but as time has gone on, I, I have a better sense of what was taking place. And uh, the reality is, you know, from, you know, 1491 on, I mean, uh, Europe was claiming these lands for themselves with the blessing of the guy on high, you know, against those heathens, those poor heathens. And th those are powerful concepts in, in history because if you were a heathen, uh, they could do anything they darn well with you, not with not only with your life, but with your land and your resources. And, and enslavement was uh, acceptable, and so that was sort of the world we uh, uh, eventually kind of kind of came crosswise with when it comes to our land, because th that so-called notion of discovery they figured gave them the right to take it, right? And that was their legal system. Well, we didn't know all of that, you know. And anyway, um, <clears throat> oddly enough, when you brought up Richard, Richard Nixon, I mean, there he is right here. Uh, you know, Tricky Dick, they called him, but as far as I'm concerned, he's a hero. And, uh, you know, he's the fellow who created self-determination. And in our case, probably uh, to the max, right? In terms of our own control of our own funds and our resources, right? But uh, oddly enough, uh, you know, he only knew one Indian, as far as I know. And that Indian was uh, Wallace Newman, who was uh, from the La Jolla Band of Mission Indians, who was a coach uh, when he went to uh, Whittier College and played football. And uh, he had so much respect for uh, Coach Newman. I, I heard the story, I don't know if it's true, that uh, uh, he, um, when he became president, he called uh, 
Coach Newman, uh, the Indian, and said, uh, well, if you ever need anything, give me a call. Well, Coach, the, Coach Newman uh, said, just take care of the Indians, is what his request was. Well, oddly enough, uh, uh, Nixon came from Whittier, California, which is where the church came from, the Friends Church came from Whittier, California, to Kotzebue in 1897 and sort of began to colonize us. Right? Anyway, I thought that's an interesting bit of, bit of history. But uh, uh, the truth of the matter is we were, uh, we were not knowledgeable about uh, the Russian era history or the American uh, practices uh, with respect to the lower 48 Indians um, when we initially got into this. And uh, we had, uh, uh, there were some real drawbacks to our situation, as Emo was mentioning in, in the beginning. First of, all, first of all, we didn't have any statewide organization at, uh, initially. We didn't have any lawyers initially. We didn't have any money. Uh, we didn't have any time, really. Uh, you have to remember that all this took place in just a five-year period, really, between 66 and 71, in terms of the real politics of it. And, and so we were actually uh, uh, fighting with sort of two hands tied behind our back. Uh, we, we didn't know, for instance, I mean, when I look back, and thank God for the University of Alaska, I've had a chance to sit and think and read. If we had known that there were less than 800 Russians in Alaska at any one time, that, that to me, that was powerful because how could they have even remotely had control of this vast space that's damn near, uh, you know, continent size, right? And, and, and so there were things like that that we didn't know. Uh, Willie, uh, Willie, I, yes. I think this is a good time. I, don't, I hate to interrupt my elders, but I feel like it's a good time to just say something really quickly. <clears throat> you know, uh, you did bring up the Alaska Historical Society and, and you talked a little bit about where does history begin in Alaska, right? Is it uh, Russian occupation? Because ANCSA, the whole thing that had resulted from ANCSA was because Russia sold Alaska to the United States, right? And then the United States realized that we, we had all these uh, resources here, hmm. specifically oh. in the north, in the far north. Well uh, and, and so that it, it's kind of like um, a pathway uh, for for what you guys ended up, you know, think about it. You guys were like young men in the summer of love. Let, let's clarify one thing. The Russia, Russians didn't have much to sell because their area of control was the Aleutians, Kodiak, portions of the Gulf. They got wiped out of Yakutat, never came back. They actually got wiped out at, at Sitka, but came back two years later. So in, in so far as having control of Alaska, they did not. And so what, what they sold was, you know, the remnants of the Russian American company properties. And the only other thing that they had, which was uh, this notion of discovery, right? If you are a Christian nation and you came upon an area that no other European country had come upon, that was sort of yours, right? Uh, but, but they did not, they never extinguished the underlying Aboriginal title. Right, yeah. which is yeah. something that in this country uh, is recognized. The sovereign has the responsibility to either recognize it or not recognize it, right? Yes. And and, uh, and so uh, when uh, so in, in reality, uh, uh, basically what the Russians sold was the right for the United States to negotiate with the proper owners, right? Which basically was ignored for a hundred years. Okay, so that I thought I'd just clarify that. Thank you so much. I think that's very important to uh, note because <clears throat> I know that the Alaska Historical Society has focused on a lot of um, the, the colonizer successes and we do have a lot of our own historical wins that we have had and the history books need to be rewritten and that our stories need to be more involved and I know that both of you guys are going to go down into history for the heavy lifting that you guys have done. And I appreciate you and all of the work that you've done, Willie, in history. 
and even Oliver. And I mean, it, it's not even just the work that you've done in documenting it, but all the work that both of you guys have done in fighting for it. And that's what I'm most curious about now is tell us about how it was like in the 60s, in the 70s, in that day and age. Because all like young people like me, well, I'm I'm 37, but I just see black and white images. <laughs> You know, I just see black and white images and I can only imagine what it was like during those days. It must have been wild times, fast times. If I may, one of the things we did not have at that time was the telephone system. If you wanted to talk to someone from Wainwright, you had to call into their city office and, and then ask people to go around to see if, they, if they'd run into this person. And, and sometimes they call back. Other times they didn't. What really talking about is the news that we created, but we had no way of putting it out there. And, and it was very, very difficult to spread the news. When you went and talked to people and have town meetings, you depended on the passage of the knowledge on to another and getting them to understand what is it we're talking about. And it was very difficult. You watch people cry. You watch people in tears, wishing they had some way of communicating to even to the next town. So it was not easy at times to get the word across. And you and and many times, like what we did, but I know the very important thing that uh, one of our elders used was parables. People learn about the Bible, and they passed it on. So they learned to to use parables as a way, as an example, to pass on the knowledge that we gained. And that's how we passed on to what we did to our villages throughout our region. And it was not easy. I mean, there was a lot of people that fought you and said, you guys, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. You say, hey, what do you mean, you got? Come on. How would you pass the knowledge that we have now on to the others? And it was just common sense. And because people had heard about the Bible and the teachings and passing on knowledge that way. Eddie Hobson, one of the great elders that we had, he was very in passing on knowledge by using parables. That's who, that's who I learned it from. But I didn't mean to go. And your internet's starting to get a little bit um, shoddy. Yeah, I was uh, thinking that um, maybe turn off the video camera for Oliver, since your your internet's kind of jumpy, and that would save bandwidth. Uh, and, and then and then what I do is I sock my kids and I tell them get off the internet. 
No one's allowed on internet when I'm in Zoom. Well, it, the connection in Utkiavik, I'm sure, is um, sketchy. It's like so, that, yeah. Um, so we'll um, maybe try that and see if that's better. That might help so we could hear your audio a little bit less jumpy. Now, um, I know that we had we had a pre-meeting and we talked about some questions, but I want to make sure that we really capture what it was like and what it felt like, because I think for some of our viewers, it's hard to imagine and encompass, like Willie, you were in college, right? During this time and Oliver came back from uh, the Vietnam War and um, you guys have become the professionals and the leaders in this, but it was, uh, some people may say it was like a ragtag team that came from very many different backgrounds, but all knew how to live off the land. That was the common thing, right? That you guys may have been trained in various different uh, fields or specialties, but you guys all ended up having to become, um, you know, external affairs professionals overnight, political leaders overnight. How was that? Um. I think my mute is off. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, you're, you're correct. Uh, we are sort of starting from ground zero. Um, we didn't have any legal or historical knowledge to speak of. We didn't understand the notion of colonialism, that there's countries out there that want what you have, uh, and they'll take it one way or the other. Um, and it had been happening, of course, throughout human history, I guess. Um, Anyway, I didn't know anything uh, until I wrote this little thing with you here. Can't see it. Can you see it? What rights to land of the Alaska Natives? The primary question. Um, well, he took uh, Charlie Edwardson from Barrow. Actually, was more knowledgeable uh, initially. Um, he learned about me uh, from Brenda Itta because I was going to school in D.C. at George Washington, and she was working. Uh, for uh, Senator Greening after she went to uh, Haskell Institute uh, where the BIA usually sent <laughs> Indians to learn a skill. Anyway, she told uh, Etuk about me. At that point, uh, Etuk had learned about uh, land issues from uh, when he was in high school down in Edgecombe. And I think he learned from uh, William Paul, who was a first native attorney. Um, and, uh, and so I, at that time, Etuk was helping organize ASNA. And uh, I've got some letters from him, handwritten, misspelled words, yellow line paper. Anyway, they were trying to decide how far south to, uh, to make their claim because there were no such thing as regional claims. Remember this in 1966, that was seven years after statehood. And so the provision in the Statehood Act that allowed the state to take 103 million acres was in process, right? The state was beginning to make those 103 million acre selections, and they were seven years into it by the time we got involved. And uh, anyway, um, uh, Eat, so he took in them, uh, they decided to make the parallel, their, their claim. And then they said, oh, well, well, Willie will take care of his area. Well, at that point, I didn't know anything, right? But that, that research paper I did for uh, Judge Rabinowitz actually gave me the tools I needed and the, and the understanding of where things were and how they came to be uh, in 1966. I mean, I had a chance to go way back and look at the Indian Treaty area, era. I had a chance to look at the Treaty of Session. I had a chance to look at the Organic Acts. I had a chance to look at the, uh, uh, the Allotment Acts. I had a chance to look at the Missions Act of 1900. I had a chance to look at the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. I had a chance to read a the Indian Reorganization Act that allowed us to form our tribes. I took a look at the Statehood Act, and I took a look at how the compens compensatory system that, that had been in place. And I, I realized at that moment that uh, they had the, they had never extinguished our underlying title, uh, even all the way through the Statehood Act. I mean, we still had what's called Aboriginal title. But the realization that I, I had that made me very, very anxious was the fact that when the state made a selection, say like they did at Prudhoe, say they took 100,000 acres, they chose it, they brought it to the secretary through the BLM and he signed it. 
that was an extinguishment. You'd never get that land back. And so, uh, but, but, but the reality was that the country was, had been in the business of taking Indian lands. And so the idea of us actually able to get land was, was really pie in the sky. I mean, it had never happened, you know? And so that, that was the big challenge. But, uh, but uh, you know, um, what we started doing was like, if you were a homesteader, like out here at uh, O'Malley or <laughs> all these people around here who had homesteads around Anchorage, uh, uh, if the state overselected on their homestead, they had a provision. They could protest the state selection to protect their rights, you know. But there was no such provision for natives. There was not even any hearings, you know, built into the Dagan uh, Statehood Act. So the Statehood Act was basically a license to seal, so to speak, you know, without comp compensation, right? And, and so to me, it was pretty damn clear that uh, we had to stop the state selections in order to protect our rights. And that's that's really what began to occur, uh, starting with Arctic Slope in January of '66, and then we did it in the summer of '66, and then from and then we had the AFN convention in the fall, uh, thanks to Emil's invitation, and then by <laughs> within a matter of a year or two, uh, let's see, uh, about a, one and a half times of Alaska was being you know selected by Native people, and that that became the great fight was because the Secretary of Interior recognized uh, that maybe there was, he had an obligation as trustee of Indian lands, maybe to uh, protect us. And so, so he wouldn't process the state selections and that became sort of the flashpoint in our, in our battle, really. So um, I, I do have something to add to that or, or something to uh, maybe help carry that conversation on a little bit more. You know, uh, we talked a little bit about the ownership of Alaska, and we talked, we kind of jumped right into uh, the, the, the land claims and listening to Nixon, but something that I want to know, these, these are the sort of things between the lines. How did the Clinton and Haida lands settlement or, or, or original uh, legal issues affect what you guys did? Because they already had some sort of negotiations, correct? Um, <clears throat> yeah, they, uh, well, they took the only route that was available to them in, in their era. And, and that route was uh, the Court of Claims. And it wasn't an easy route uh, because you had, to, you had to have a lawyer or somebody to help you get a resolution through the Congress that would authorize the tribe to sue the United States. And of course, once you did that, then the tribe had to have the money to hire a lawyer and, cons uh, and uh, an anthropologist. <laughs> and and the, the lawyer's job was to determine whether or not there had been an illegal taking and the time of the taking. And usually it's like 50 or 75 or maybe hundred years before, right? And, and the anthropologist's jo job was to determine the extent of use and occupancy, which in other words, how, how much land did the tribe utilize to survive, right? And that usually was in the millions of acres, right? And so they would, uh, then they, at the end, they would, uh, if, if, they, if they proved there was an illegal taking, which there was in the case of the Tongass forests that were taken from them by the United States government, uh, they multiplied the, the 16 million acres or so times the value at the time of the taking, which was pennies, right? And so all they got was seven and a half million dollars, and not not an not an not an uh, not an acre of land. And so that that was really impactful. When I was doing my little research, I thought, "Holy smokes, that that whole system is stacked against the native people." And so we there was the, in my mind, <laughs> I was just a kid at the time, but I, I thought to myself, you know, we have to have something new, something that's more equitable, right? Oh, yeah. And that's what we went after, something different. Definitely. Man, <clears throat> every time I listen to you guys speak, I get fired up like, all right, let's do this. Let's, and then you, I mean, but now we're looking back, this is history. This is what had happened. And at that time, I imagine it was a challenge. What sort of reaction were you guys getting from the public or um, the, I mean, 
when you guys went to DC, I imagine both you and Oliver went to it DC like to go and fight this stuff. What was it like? Well, if I may, you know, as we went along, the more we found out about this knowledge, the more we wanted to do. So I heard this guy that was writing a land land claims bill, Anxa, just the lawyer that had been hired. He was the general counsel to a chairman of a committee. So he wrote down all the things that the chairman wanted. I wanted that lawyer because he had some knowledge of the things we didn't know anything about. So I went back and I said, I tell you what, I'll set you in office. I'll give you some money. And you shut up, you set up your shop, but I want to be one of your first clients. Because you know something about land claims. You know something about what goes on in the lawyer's mind oh, and what Congress is like. And he was the general counsel to the, the interior department, the interior committee. So when he came out and set up his law, law offices, I was one of his big clients because I had already given him and signed over a bunch of money. These are for your law books. This is for your law offices, for your library. So as we went along, we learned things. And became knowledgeable. Then we started hiring people. And the guy's name was Bill Van Ness. He was the general counsel to the Interior Committee. Because he wrote the land claims bill. And uh, you know how <clears throat> when you're having conversations and having good times and having a few drinks, you accuse each other of a few. You to accuse him about, you mucked us over. You sold us out. And I would, I would think that, you know, he felt shame. His whole law firm became the land claims type lawyer. And then I became very close friends with the chairman of the committee through this lawyer. There was a lot to learn. Was, there was still a lot, a lot more to learn about how to claim land, how to go about the, and that's how you made friends. Learn to negotiate with the guy one on one, with the guy that's going to sponsor a bill. Oliver? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to add uh, a little bit more to Oliver. Uh, you asked, you know, what was this like? <laughs> what was this like? It was terrible. I mean, we were fighting the whole world. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, Secretary Udall, our hero, 
uh, you had to understand the importance of the what so-called land freeze, where the secretary decided that maybe he needed to try to protect as trustee native lands because Congress had never ever defined which lands were ours. But but if you use the if you use the standard that was in the uh, court of claims, that is the extent of use and occupancy, we ex there was not an acre of land in Alaska that wasn't controlled by some group in historical times. And of course, sometimes those those boundaries shifted, but people fought hard to control their space because it meant the survival of their people, right? Um, and uh, and so that land that land freeze uh, became a flashpoint, and it, especially so in 1968 when Arco found Prudhoe Bay. All of a sudden, this was big time politics. You know, I'm the stakes all of a sudden grew dramatically. And I just remember, uh, uh, you know, when uh, um, uh, when Mike Wallace from 60 Minutes came to Alaska, he thought he was going to do a big oil story back in 69. Uh, when he got up here, he realized the story was, well, who owns it? Whose land is that? Right. And of course, at that point, we needed national exposure because you can't go after national legislation. Uh, congressional legislation without having the public behind you on something as massive as what came out. So we really needed that uh, national exposure. And Mike Wallace did a great job, I thought, of telling our story. Of course, he gave both sides, the, you know, the, an the state's anti-Native claims side, and, and, but our side. Uh, so that, that was important. But uh, Secretary Udall deserves a statue, in my opinion. He was one of the most hated guys by the non-Native community, but he was a hero to us. But, but without that land freeze, they were going to run over us. You know, if they had gotten the pipeline without resolving the question of Native claims, we would still be, right now, twiddling our thumbs with no regional corporations, no village corporations. We'd be sitting, waiting for a decision from the Court of Claims which would include absolutely no land whatsoever, you know. So th that that to me is the reality uh, of what we were facing back then. But but the good news is, you know, the native people stuck together, and Emil Emil mentioned that it was not easy. It absolutely was not easy because you had a whole conglomeration of natives, uh, you know, with many different inter interests, different si different uh, sized groups different ways of life, different languages, and uh, oftentimes had been historical enemies, right? So we, we, had, we had to work hard to keep that unity because that, in the end, that was really what delivered for us. But uh, on the other side, uh, if the state was not a player and wasn't moving forward with some ideas of their own, if they had, in fact, their, their, Wally Hickel's initial thing was to, you know, dig in, you know, say, wait a minute, yeah. you know, Congress, you said we could have this land, it's ours, the hell with those natives. Well, uh, Uncle Wally, good for him, was pragmatic, you know. Uh, he, was, he was a deal maker. And in the end, it, it served us well. Uh, because, and most Alaskans, I don't think, realize this, that he was actually the first public official to support 40 million acres. The first. Even our hero, <laughs> Secretary Udall, through his department, I think they're only really willing to give seven to ten million. You know, so yeah, forty-four million acres in the context of Alaska isn't a lot, but in the context of Native American settlements, it's it's pretty sizable. You know, we almost as, have as much land as all the American Indians put together. You know, and and we still hear moaning and groaning. Of course, we moaned and groaned. In fact, when you talk about uh, what was it like that night when Joe spoke? There was quite a few who spoke. Emil spoke, I spoke, Don Wright spoke, others spoke. But you know, after five years of struggle, just hanging on, you'd think that there would have been celebration. But there wasn't. It was, we knew what we were giving up, right? We knew what we were giving up. And we had an uncertain future because what the hell did we know about business, right? Uh, so, I mean, 
I think I think the remarkable story is that people just didn't sit back and cry about it all. They said, well, what the heck, let's get this thing together and let's see what we can do with it. And then that's what people have done. And I think that's remarkable. Willie, really, you bring up an excellent point that um, we had, I mean, in many ways, the Alaska natives with ANCSA and the announcement of what Nixon said out loud was uh, a better deal than any law 48 natives ever received in some ways, because we won land, title to land. However, we lost certain rights in Tel Anelka. But uh, what I wanted to bring up is that, you know, uh, we wouldn't even have gotten to that point if it wasn't for the relationships that were built right around that time. And we heard email say, yeah, well, my tribe was fighting with Unilically. I could hear my grandfather talking about them killing each other. <clears throat> and I know that uh, because we are so diverse in Alaska and, uh, but you guys had maybe all gone to Mount Edgecum or, or uh, Chamawa or what have you. I know those relationships were integral and it, was a, it wasn't always good. It wasn't always fun. It wasn't always great, but you guys came together during a time where we needed to come together. Now, so there's a couple of questions I want to ask you guys. Is it, uh, uh, what were those relationships like with people that you knew were warring tribes that you didn't like, or you fought, maybe you might have gotten a fight with them at Mount Edgecum. And then what was it like uh, trying to build relationships with people at DC? And how did you have to? Because you know that it's it's it, when you fight someone at Monarchcom, that's going to be something. But when you fight with them at DC, that's going to be a do or die of a bill, right? So I want to hear a little bit more about your guys' relationships in state and out of state. We <laughs> we we saw those things coming. I mean, like. John Sackett and I were roommates for three years. He was Doyon. I was Arctic Slope. Shit. We were together. Our grandfathers. They hated each other. They didn't even like to get near each other. But we knew sometimes that you got to become friends. And it wasn't easy. Nothing in life during that time was easy. Because we didn't know how. We experienced it before. I mean, there were rough times, but we made it work. I mean, we sat and talked around, you know, have a couple of beers in the evenings about, teased each other about our Eskimo Indian wars and, and some of the stories that we'd heard. But we found a way when we to get together. And we talk, we often talked about those things. And it wasn't easy sometimes. But somehow, You say, oh, buddy, we got to sit down and talk. And we managed. And especially, you know, like our boundaries. They went up here. They went down over there. I mean, it's just like a seesaw.
I mean, we uh, we found ways. Oliver, if I may, um, there's a couple of questions I want to ask you and Willie. Um, one, I want to know a little bit more about how relationships were in DC for you guys. And then two, how the idea of corporations came about. Well, relations among each other as, as uh, it, it's just natural of, of coming together and talking and learning about each other and the things and the customs that we had that were so different. Uh, we made fun of each other. We had good times. But corporations were really somehow Congress was looking for ways to not have reservations. They were done with reservations. They didn't like reservation systems. So they, they were looking for a way economically to put something together. And that's how the idea of the corporations came. Because it, was, it really came from Congress. And, uh, nope. and there were people in Congress that would just sell, just as soon sell you out. Let the devil have you. I think Willie wanted to say something about corporations. Oliver, Oliver. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> if you can see this little thing here, if I can get it up big enough for, can you see it? Proposal for settlement of the Alaska Native Land Claims, a report of the Governor's Task Force on Native Land Claims, January, Juno, January. 10th through 18th, 1968, to the Honorable Walter J. Hickel, Governor. And I want you to see who signed the doggone thing. See where? <laughs> Willie Hensley, Chairman. Uh, for you historians, I mean, almost nobody knows this official report that actually was, the reason it's so small, it's because it was designed to fit in the House of Representatives daily, daily log in Juneau. And uh, let me give you the, the political context of where we were at this particular time. Uh, Wally Hickel was the first one to have to face the issue of native regional claims that resulted in that land freeze. And as you might recall, uh, Alaska had a little population of just over 200,000 people had no significant industries, was a high cost state to do anything. We had a little bit of oil production in Kenai. Otherwise, Egan was running a failing state in the 1960s. When I got there in 67, our state budget was only $100 million. And he had to work hard to do that. And we, we didn't have any money to spend on capital improvements. We had to sell vote on, statewide on bonds. Well. They also, the state was supposed to get 90% of all the revenue from federal lands. Well, when we started those regional claims, it kind of froze the revenue that was coming to the state from that source. And back then, you know, a million dollars could build a gigantic building. So a million dollars was a lot of money. We we're, we we're causing the state to lose money. Well, well, so Wally, to protect the state, he was gonna run over us uh, politically or legally, right? to do his job. Well, our job was to hang in there and try to protect our claims. Well, the problem was, as Emil noted earlier, we had nothing. We had no money. We had, 
you know, we had members who had no money to pay a membership fee. We, uh, we had to have contracts for Emo from AFN to just to have him in office. We couldn't even get together to come up with a position for God's sake. You know, we, we had no time. I mean, you know, if we had like a year to contemplate stuff or, or, or to plan and, you know, think about this, that or not, we didn't have that time. I mean, one, once I found that oil, it was, you know, crazier than heck, the, the pressure was on. And so, uh, but uh, wa the way we got it off, like I said earlier, if the state wasn't playing ball, there's no bill. If the states were, if the United, if, if the natives were divided, there's no bill because the system won't work back there. People won't know what to do back in DC, especially our delegation. <clears throat> so it was absolutely critical that we get the state on board. And the way we did that was by working with Wally to form this task force. They put the entire AFN board on it. The board voted to select a, a, a task force, a land claims task force, which I chaired. Sackett was on it, John Borbridge was on it. We had somebody from Arctic Slope. I think Hugh Nichols was on it. Maybe Emil, I mean, uh, Eben may have come some of the time. Uh, Cecil Barnes was on it from Chugach. We had we tried to spread it out and we only had like a week or so because there were gonna be Senate hearings. And so let me give you the language as to how, this is how we got up with the 40 million acres. We proposed 40 million acres. That was our first thing. 40 million grant of 40 million acres of land in fee. Now that's highly unusual, highly unusual. Private property, not trust land, right? Okay, a 10% royalty interest in outer continental shelf, a 5% royalty on from st the state. Now that was new. The state was making a concession. In the end, the state paid for half the billion dollars, right? Okay, and then, uh, a license to use the surface of lands for hunting and fishing purposes. And in the end, uh, uh, here's what we said. The objective of the task force is to avoid courts and litigation, simplify the administrative process, accomplish this early, let's not wait a hundred years like the court of claims, a grant of present property interests avoidance of state and federal control. And that was critical because Emil mentioned Joe Fitzgerald. <laughs> this is Joe Fitzgerald's six pound, you know, 400 page document. But in reality, Joe Fitzgerald under contract to Senator Jackson, who was chairman of the committee, basically his idea was to use this, a, a proposed settlement to essentially Im eliminate the cultures because they saw the villages as racial enclaves. And uh, while, they, while they come up with one good thing, they came up with the biggest dollar amount, which is the billion dollars. Uh, what his administrative process would have been presidential appointed group to a commission. All natives in Alaska would have been enrolled as uh, shareholders. And in 10 years, it was gonna be public. There was absolutely going to be no native entity, right? Under under Senator Jackson's contractor, right? The first study in a hundred years. Okay, so that that was what we faced on that side. Well, the Secretary of Interior, his job, he was going to he was going to control it through a commission. It'd be trust land, you know. In his in his big number, you know what his big number was? One hundred and eighty million dollars. Because he said, well, what? How much was the best Indian settlement? They figured, well, it was the Senecas at $3,000 per person for the building of the Kenzua Dam. Well, so, so even our best hero was recommending less than $200 million. You see, you see we, had to, we had to go from Zilcho to 40 million. We had to go from Z Zilcho to a billion, right? And, and so that took a lot of effort. And, and the reason it was done is because we, we hung together in spite of our differences, right? And uh, that, that, so, so uh, the, the last one was utilizing modern corporate forms for emerging, engaging in business enterprise by native groups. That's where it came from, was that task force that nobody remembers. Those ideas actually followed Wally Hickel when he became Secretary of Interior, right? So he, he already had supported the 40 million acres. And uh, so some of those ideas survived the recommendation to the state. But the, to me, the, the important part is that, uh, that uh, 
that that report changed the tone in Alaska. Because I was in the legislature, I knew what was going on. Uh, the legislature actually passed a bill committing $25 million to a settlement, but it was contingent on lifting the freeze, which of course didn't happen, but it was there, it was a good intent. Uh, and also Bob Atwood, the Anchorage Times, who had been fighting native claims since the 40s, by God, he thought it was, you know, uh, the recommendations were good. So so that work of that task force, Emil, Emil was on it, you know, was very, very critical uh, because it it kept the state moving forward. If we had come up, come out and said, we state, we want 200 reservations, you know, the, the state would have gone nuts. They, were, they would not be on board. And so, you know, when you're engaged in negotiations, I mean, you know, you can't get everything you want, especially if you're a minority, because you're basically a supplicant on your hands and knees. And, and when the door is shut back in DC or outside and they're inside cutting the deal, right? So you do the best you can. So Willie, I'm getting a I'm getting a slew of questions here, and I'm getting text messages too. There's a lot of engagement of what you guys are talking about, and honestly, I feel guilty that I feel like I should have gave you guys a four hour session to talk because you guys are so full of knowledge, and uh, you guys are the experts in the field. How many people are left from our region that were there fighting for this? Not a whole lot, and you guys were there. So some of the questions, I'm just going to kind of uh, field a little bit of the questions and, and summarize them in some ways. Um, some people are asking about uh, what were the most controversial parts of ANCSA that either you guys were for or against, or they. a lot of people want to know about Eduk, because we know Eduk was... He was a brilliant man, but he struggled in some ways, but he was very radical and let his presence be known. And people are still talking about him. So there's Eduk. And then uh, people want to know about Senator Ted Stevens. Was he our friend? Was he our foe? I know Oliver has some stories about Stevens and how he was able to sway him to get him to go our way because at first he might not have been so friendly so there's stevens he took and then uh and then now is there is there you know from what you guys went through back then this is the third question <clears throat> now we're in a pandemic there's a disconnection maybe because we're all having to be isolated um do you think that that original Spanish flu when a lot of people died had given us strength or weakened us to be able to handle ANCSA or it took away from our power and our strength to handle it? So there's those three questions. He took Senator Stevens, uh, Spanish flu. Uh, we we have uh, only 20 minutes left, so take those questions as you will. Whichever questions you guys want to go for first, whatever's most meaningful, I'll let you guys go. Avilan, look at them. Ah, okay. Look at Oh, <clears throat> Etuk was a fun guy. He was brilliant, crazy. He was a lot of fun because he'll make you talk forever just to defend what you've come up with or what you think might work. Uh, Ted Stevens, hell, he was, he was Arctic Slope's friend. We didn't have a relationship with Ted Stevens when the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act passed. And we said to Joe, our chairman, he said, Chair, you can't have enemies back there, especially like Ted Stevens. 
because he was our senior senator. You couldn't get anything passed with, without him. So he said, find a way to be able to talk to him. So I just picked up the phone right at his desk and called his office and asked for Ann Stevens, Ted's wife. He loved I think we might have lost Oliver's connection. Okay. Um, Oliver, <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. Oliver, are you there? Let me call up Martina and see what's going on. It might I, be the, their internet and you might need to log back on. I don't know. Yeah, let me, uh, I'm going to put myself on mute. Uh, Willie, if you would like to talk a little bit okay. more about uh, e <clears throat> Okay. And Ted um, Stevens, or or and I mean even just. Okay, let me uh, let me. I know there's an interest in uh, many of the leaders who may may not be well known, um, and some of the key players. Uh, yes. In office, uh, and uh, maybe I can talk a little bit, bit about them until Oliver comes back. Um, but uh, uh, of course, uh, on, on the local level, the, the key. Uh, key political players uh, at the state level were Governor Hickel initially, and then later on, e e Governor Egan came back and he came back at a very, very key time. Uh, but e uh, uh, Hickel beat Egan in the 60, uh, 66 election by a small margin, in part by appealing to native voters actually. Um, and then uh, of course, uh, Bartlett died. So when H Hickel was governor, he appointed uh, Ted Stevens who I served with in the house. And Stevens was knowledgeable because you know he was a lawyer. He'd been in the Interior Department uh, as a young lawyer during a statehood fight, uh, so he, he was not new to uh, uh, Indian Indian issues per se. Um, and then, of course, uh, Greening was in office, and let me tell you, uh, Greening was a very brilliant man. He'd been territorial governor. He was a medical doctor, Harvard graduate. He's been a diplomat. He was an author. He had been governor of the territory under uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And uh, he also was a United States Senator. But you know, I had a conflict with him right off the bat, it, just as a student really, when I challenged some comments he made in the press when I was doing my research on my land claims paper. He said basically something like, well, uh, what we need to do is uh, pay off the natives and get on with the development of this land. <laughs> <laughs> that really ticked me off uh, at, at first. And, and then because I thought he was throwing cold water on whatever legitimate claims we might have. And, uh, and of course, I didn't know his, his, his history at that point in time. Uh, so we actually, he and I met because uh, uh, he asked to meet with me. And uh, so we had our little conversation and he blamed the Interior Department for not doing anything. But I, I said, well, Senator, uh, under our system, the secretary can't solve the problem. It's a congressional responsibility. And you're the one that set up this conflict because as Senator, you authorized, you know, the, uh, or as a, you lobbied for the, for the statehood act and uh, it, it, it's trying to take our land without compensation. So we met when our separate ways and, you know, Greening did not believe, I don't think, in anything that related to uh, I Indian uh, tribes having legal, you know, relationship with the federal government. I don't think he believed anything like the Bureau of Indian Affairs. You know, I don't think he would have supported uh, indigenous controlled even corporations. And so I, I think we're darn lucky that uh, we supported Mike Gravel and, and he won. And he and he helped deliver because he was in the majority with uh, Senator Jackson. Uh, Stevens uh, was an appointee of Hickel, and, and initially we were quite leery of him because basically, um, you know, he had run before and lost, and so uh, Hickel gave him new life politically. But but at that point we were fighting uh, tooth and tongue to try to keep the land freeze because 
without the land freeze, we we're going to get run over there. If they got that pipeline, they'd forget about us. Uh, so, but, but uh, as it turns out, you know, Stevens played a very key role because he was the same party of the president, right? And he helped get the president on board. And then there was Nick Begich, who was a very, he was my roommate in Juneau when we were in the legislature. Uh, and, and he also helped deliver on, on the House side. Uh, those are the politicians over there. And, uh, and then on the Native side, uh, I'm going to read you some names of, of people who, who are volunteering, no pay, taking their time. People like Emil, John Borbridge, Flory Lekanoff from the Alley, Jerome Trigg from Nome, Miles Brandon, who is in Upech but lived in the uh, Bristol Bay area, Cecil Barnes, who was the father of Chugach, Don Wright, who was our president at the time, Keto, Sam Keto, George Miller from Kenai, Byron Malott, Roy Ewan from the interior of Adna, Al Kessler. Al, Al deserves more recognition because he was actually there before many of us were. You know, he made a visit to see Secretary Udall before there was even an AFN. Uh, Roy Ewan, uh, Ger Gerald Ivey, uh, Eben Hobson, Fred Bismarck, Philip Guy, long gone, George Andola, Flora Thiel from the Kenai area. So those are some of the people, Alice Brown, there's others like that who are long gone, who took the time to Larry Oskolkoff, uh, Margaret Nick, Don Watson from the Beth uh, from here, but because he had a brother in Bethel, Tim Wallace, Harry Carter, you know, uh, all, all those people uh, gave their time and effort to and their minds to try to come up with uh, uh, solutions to this really, really complex problem. <clears throat> Man, huh, you have so much uh, detailed information, and I want to make sure that uh, we're hitting everybody's questions, comments, concerns. So uh, if you guys have any questions, please go to the chat. I've, I've been fielding them as I can and uh, throwing them out to our experts mm. as, as you know, uh, time allows. Um, I think um, the one question that, so there's something that, uh, that people are wanting to know in terms of our pandemic that we're in now. Yeah. You I, think I, that I, I see I see that question, uh, Patuk. Um, you know, um, we were in our own pandemic actually at the time. Uh, you know, we we're dying of tuberculosis. Yes. You know, yes. I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, I have. <laughs> notes here uh, on uh, from chills and fevers, uh, Dr. Fortine's uh, uh, big book on the diseases that native people had uh, uh, had in, in, encountered going back to the 1830s, smallpox epidemic 1835 to 1840, maybe wiping out a third of the population in southern southern part of Alaska. Then there was diphtheria, whooping cough, gonorrhea, typhoid, tuberculosis just was wiping us out that, then so, uh, you know, those uh, diseases were not new to us. We just suffer, kind of suffered through them. I mean, almost all of us were impacted by TB. But I think, you know, what in my mind, I mean, what really shaped the the people's dedication back then who were involved was that we were all struggling through life, right? We had to work hard. You know, we had to be. We were hungry. We were cold. Uh, we had to run, walk, lift push, you know, we had to chop, we had to get out there in the cold weather to make a livelihood. And I think people knew all that and they wanted their, their, their children and grandchildren to have something better, right? Something, their life was a little easier. And uh, for all those who are <laughs> shooting arrows at the settlement, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we, we didn't even remotely think about a corporation in the beginning. That was not the idea. The idea was to get that land so that our people can continue their existence as special people of the earth, right? Because they were all tied to that land after 10,000 years. But, you know, like I said, you know, you don't control the process as a minority. You're, you're, you're basically on hands and knees working as hard as you could to get something, you know? And uh, thank God the stars lined up that we did get something not what we should have gotten. We should have got, we could have gotten more actually. I think if uh, if the non-native community had been a little bit more open-minded, I mean, 
I could read you some uh, <laughs> some quotes from <laughs> from some. Oh, right here, I got, I got it right here. You want to hear this one? Yes. This is from my we neighbor. Do. We do. This is my this is my neighbor, and and you know our region is big into mining and this guy was head of the miners association he says uh if my understanding of this purchase agreement is correct then these claims which we are discussing today should rightfully be directed to the russian government i submit to you that neither the united states the state of alaska nor any of us here gathered as individuals owe the natives one acre of ground or one cent of the taxpayers money <laughs> that, that was my neighbor george morley <laughs> and so uh anyway uh, so we, I mean, you talk about hot politics. I mean, you think you think anti-masking and vaccine is hot. You should have been around back then when we were battling over who owned Alaska. It was a struggle. But you know, uh, had they uh, had they not had the uh, e and Emil didn't mention it, but uh, e even the Chamber of Commerce were uh, mocking natives because Don Dickey, who ran the chamber, when they had a convention, he was running around with a cowboy hat with an arrow running through it. That was his view about you know the native claims, right? And so now all these business entities, you know, they think you think they were our last, our last great buddy, but in reality, in the beginning, they were they were fighting us tooth and tongue, including the, uh, the Alaska Territorial Sportsmen, the uh, you know the timber industry, uh, you know the, the, we were fighting everybody. But uh, if 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 even people like Bob Atwood, who ran the biggest newspaper. Uh, you know, he had been anti-native land since the 40s when the secretary had power to create reservations in Alaska. I mean, he and, uh, uh, you know, Greening, Greening was a left winger. Robert was, a, you know, a, a right winger. But uh, when it came to claims, they were sort of like one. They were in agreement. I think Gr Greening went ape when he heard about the creation of the uh, of the uh, reserve up there at Venati. He just, he just went ape. And I think that's probably what turned him against the idea of natives owning any land. Uh, anyway, uh, that's kind of a little bit of the story, well, story we, there. Man, and I, I, I feel real bad every time I interrupt you because I don't wanna be that That's person. okay, that's your job. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm learning from you always with the history and I'm learning even how to become a moderator even a little bit better. So don't be offended if I do interrupt you because uh, I would have got spanked if I was at home in Barrow right now. My dad would have probably, don't interrupt. Anyways, I know that there have been, we are running out of time. We've got about five minutes. I see some questions in the chat. I've, I've been told that we can go up to 3.15. Uh, so that's like the longest we can go. There are some other questions uh, in the chat. Um, now, Patu, this is this is Karen. I'm going to just yeah. interrupt with a question that um, has been asked and sort of summarize it for Oliver. Um, that at the time of land claims, the Arctic Slope Native Association was not particularly on board um, because of the acreage and um, the claim that you know they never the Inupiaq never gave Russia permission to even sell their part of Alaska to the United States, and so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what was going on with that issue at the time, and um, how you guys worked through all that, and finally decided to sign on to the Settlement Act. Can you guys hear? Us okay? Yeah. Go ahead. Maybe you could turn your video on too. It might work now. Hey, Dad, you're good. You can answer the question. What's that? You can answer the question. I can hear you. God. Question was twofold. Well, the question was about the ASNA not wanting to sign on to the ANSCA and all that um, fight over the acreage and the legality of it. So, you know, ASRC is well, not with our, uh, AFN and then, then you guys our, didn't want to... Oh, sorry. Our belief was that 40 million wasn't enough. We wanted a lot more land, like 60. 
60 million acres rather than 40 million acres. And as simple as that, uh, You might actually have to turn off. Yeah, we always thought that you sell the land. Hmm. Believe in that. Um, no. Yeah. Um, maybe I could help clarify that point. Uh, that was one of the big internal like I said, if we're, if the natives were divided, we were screwed. Uh, that was one of the big issues. Uh, another issue, uh, the, the, I mean, Arctic Slope, one of the problems was we had, <clears throat> we had an AFN that had no, uh, it was a volunteer group, big tent. So we had urban native groups like Fairbanks Native Association. We had, you know, urban groups like uh, uh, our host, uh, Cook Inlet. Uh, we had uh, tribes like uh, Tlingit Haida. We had Tanana Chiefs, big group. We had AVCP, big group. We had village, you know, village, village tribes with the same vote as I did. I had 11 villages, they had one. Well, anyway, what we tried to do was deal with every major issue that was going to divide us and complicate our ability to get through Washington. And uh, 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 the, uh, in, in the case of Arctic Slope, like the, you know, the further north you go in Alaska, the more spread out the people are out of necessity because that's where the animal life was. You could not have big towns except places like Point Hope where they had hundreds of people because they had the protein. Well, so under the settlement act, it was going to be the, the land was going to be divided, you know, based on the enrollment. Well, that meant that our slope was going to get small land, even though they used a lot of land. So we came up with that land loss formula that allowed them to get more. That's how we re resolved that issue. Uh, one of the other issues was Seven uh, I. Well, uh, it wasn't exactly something that uh, I think we dreamt up. I think what I saw was that. Secretary Udall being questioned by Senator Hansen from out west. The senator uh, says, uh, Secretary, what about a village if it uh, ends up finding uh, um, uh, 10 million barrels of oil over here and then down along the river, three or four, 10 miles was another village that has nothing. What are you going to do about that? The secretary said, oh, oh, we've thought about that. He said, you know, we came up with this idea of 50-50, you know, sharing. Well, somehow that ended up becoming 70-30, you know, and ended up in the act. But, but in a way, uh, back then, we didn't know who was going to have what, you know. And so if you want 70% of what I got, I don't have anything. So, yeah, you can have 70%. But, but in the end, that, you know, we're living with that. And as a consequence, uh, I know the Arctic Slope has paid millions and millions uh, in 7i. And uh, Nana, we've paid about a billion and a half to the other regional corporations and the villages. So, uh, I mean, you know, it's, I think it's something that needs to be looked at, uh, you know, for the developer region in the future, but uh, because I think it's a, a somewhat unfair. <clears throat> now, uh, I just wanna uh, open it up a little bit more to anybody else that might have had questions to our uh, esteemed elders, Oliver and Willie. I think what we're gonna to try to do is get Oliver on, on a phone line to make sure that the connection is solid. But if anybody has any questions for Willie in regards to all of this, please uh, do not hesitate to ask either in the chat. I don't know if they could ask Karen, can they ask directly? Who can ask directly? The people in the audience? Yeah, yeah. If they raise okay. their hand, I can give them voice. Um, okay. Privileges. If anybody has a question directly for uh, Willie while we get Oliver set up with the uh, dial in number. Uh, uh, may I make one point? 
Yeah, um, go ahead. Some people think that this is an oil bill. <laughs> well, actually, the oil industry, um, you know, we were kind of holding them hostage in a way because of the land freeze. We wouldn't let them get there right away until we got our problem solved, right? But we had to play that very careful because uh, the whole nation wanted that oil, you know? And if we didn't play our cards, cards right, we were always concerned that uh, since we didn't know all about Washington DC, we thought, well, maybe they could just, the president could just, or even the Secretary of Interior could, Interior could just issue an executive order saying, by gosh, we want that pipeline. We need it. Kaboom! Here's a here's a here's the right away, and then we're we're going to be dead in the water, right? But thankfully, that didn't happen. But we always were concerned about that uh, because if they got the oil pipeline and the oil, like I say, we we're going to be put in the backwater, and there would still be no settlement, in my opinion. Uh, but Ed Patton, who was head of the uh, um, consortium of oil companies that own uh, had the lease at Prudhoe Bay. He realized, and he, they had some good advice from uh, people like Hugh Gallagher, who was a, in a wheelchair, used to be at work for uh, Senator Bartlett, who was lobbying for BP, and others who encouraged them to uh, support uh, the passage of a bill. Because for them, it would mean security of their lease and also, also a right of way. And so Ed, when Ed Patton backed the land settlement bill, it, it made it a hell of a lot easier for the uh, for the Chamber of Commerce and all those other business people that have been fighting us to get on board, right? So that's one point I wanted to make. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we just had some questions that hit the chat. Uh, uh, the loss of Aboriginal hunting and fishing rights, that's a big issue. Why was this necessary? I mean, that, that sort of, that switched up during Anilka. But that, I mean, I don't know if we're just focusing on ANCSA and not everything else that happened after that. That's that's one thing. Uh, we have a couple more questions after that. I don't know if you guys wanted to. I think we have Oliver back um, by phone. So if yeah. you ask if, if, to if, unmute. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, if you guys wanna discuss Aboriginal hunting and fishing rights in the first, act and why we had to do a nail or what was the import or what was the maybe that might have been a reason why people were against ANCSA in the first place extinguishing our subsistence rights on these certain lands would you guys like to talk a little bit about that um Patrick do you remember what are the um on the phone how they unmute themselves do you remember what it's like question? star oh, shoot um let me look real star quick. nine or something like that. Um, let's look on trusty Google. Home. You should be able to just talk. Um, um, can you hear us okay? Oh, can you hear yes. Okay? yes, 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 yes. I'm going to mute myself because there's an echo. Yeah, go ahead, um, Oliver. Yeah, there's an echo, I think, because of your um, computer being on. Turn the, turn the connection on the computer off and then just do the phone one. That's it. Oh, it's star six. Thank you, Freya. Or just turn down your computer volume. Martina, that will get rid of the echo. I thought by having you on mute it would, but it doesn't. Um, so we have a couple of uh, questions um, in the chat. I mean, people raising their hands. Um, Uh, what happened? Oh, Col I think Colleen, did you have your hand raised? And now it went away, but um, Ron, in a way, had a question. Yeah. 
Yes, I want to thank everyone for participating in this, this series of, uh, and particularly when you have these firsthand explanations of things that really are very parallel to a extensive bibliography that's being prepared on ANCS at 50. Those of us work, that are working on it have heard bits and pieces of what you folks have discussed very, very well in putting all of those pieces into a context that we previously have probably never heard of. So I want to extend my thanks to all of you for doing that. And some of you I know I've appealed to before, particularly to Emil and to folks who have very valuable papers. I really urge you to think about the donation of those papers into an archive where people who are interested will have access to them. During the process of putting this bibliography together, we realized that there are many significant folks who really haven't had any, any documentation. And I urge you to consider having those things placed into a depository wherever you think possible that would make them secure, that would be safe, and that would be useful for future generations to look at. Because if you probably gauge, there are lots of people who are curious. And without your contributions, we would never know these things. So thank you very much for your contributions. Most definitely. Thank you so much, Willie and Oliver, for all of your hard work. Not just your hard work, but your willingness to talk about it now. I mean, there were many of uh, the leaders that were fighting back then that one, aren't alive today. And then some of them, they may not even feel comfortable to talk, but you, Willie and you, Oliver, are, uh, are real leaders that are still willing to teach and that is priceless. And, and um, I can never repay you for your willingness to join in on this. You, like I said in the beginning, you guys uh, have been rock stars to me in my upbringing to give me hope and know that there's a lot that we can do as native people as, as leaders, young leaders, because you guys started out probably in your 20s and you guys are still going. And I, I, uh, I respect you guys at the utmost. So, and a view one. You're on mute, Willie. Yeah, for the invitation, it was fun, uh, and uh, I hope it's useful to your audience. Uh, in my opinion, we really do need historians in our native world. Uh, uh, you know, there are so many uh, is issues, not only current issues, but historical issues that that should be looked at from an indigenous perspective, uh, because you know, all of my life I've collected books uh, and maps and you name it. And it usually always was by somebody else looking at us right? <laughs> and then making their judgments. And, uh, and quite often, of course, uh, the indigenous perspective is quite different about you know, events that have transpired. And I'm thinking about issues like uh, the Rampart Dam or issues like, uh, uh, the uh, nuclear project uh, of uh, the atomic uh, project chariot, uh, you know, issues relating to uh, testing of uh, medical testing of indigenous peoples. Uh, I mean, there's just a, such a world of stuff out there that uh, that needs, uh, you know, research and writing about. And uh, I really challenge the schools to do a better job uh, than they're doing with the Alaska history requirement. Uh, you know, oftentimes they, they pick the most recent arrival from New York City to be the, the expert on indigenous or Alaskan history. And we need to we need to do more. I mean, it's, it's, it's just sad. Anyway, that's that's my parting comment. Going up, Willie, do we have Oliver? We lost the phone connection. Um, I don't know if we can still get Zoom from them. Oliver, um, are you are you there, Oliver? Uh, 
if, if all else fails, let me call up Martina real quick and ask her. Uh, <clears throat> and I, you know what? This is what I want to encourage our uh, AHS board. We need to continue this discussion. Yeah, Martina. Oh. Oh, hold on. Sorry. So, Patrick, why don't you mute? Your, uh, why don't you mute? Oh, oh, wait, Oliver. Martina, you guys there? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. Just I was to, just. Go ahead. I wanted to make sure we uh, got some closing comments, and I I did want to make the note that we need to continue this discussion. Just talking to you and really uh, the past few days in preparation for this have um, uh, encouraged me and may, inspired me to realize the importance to continue this discussion that our history did not start when Russians came here or when America bought, uh, United States bought Alaska. It's so much more than that. And we have a rich history. So, uh, we, you know, I want to hear what you have to say about your time and any closing comments that you have to say about um, your fight with INCSA and your successes. Hmm. Well, I think we are far enough. I, I mean, I think we got to find ways to uh, find common ground. To, to help and assist each other. And fighting each other. I mean, there's a lot of the nice stuff that we went through. Uh, amongst each other, amongst the 12 regions. Uh, hmm? Hey. And I want to thank you for knowledgeable person that you are about the land claims and and what it's done for our region. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. I sure appreciate it. And I know that um, you've always encouraged me when I started doing my, <clears throat> my uh, cultural documentary work in our region. And you've told me that uh, this is what we've been trying to do for 30 years, to tell our own stories. And so I, I always think about that and it encourages me every time that I work with others to talk with others and capture our stories so that our younger generations may hear it. And I am so appreciative of you, Willie, uh, even to be willing to share your time, both of you guys, to share with our uh, AHS group and then anyone else that has registered for the conference. So thank you all that who, uh, who was participating. Uh, I look forward to many more sessions like this in the future. Uh, Willie, is there anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, just uh, really appreciate uh, the, uh, the audience and all those really great questions. Um, I, I know it's something that you all don't think about every day, but, uh, uh, you know, it's something that people like Oliver and myself kind of live through. And, uh, I, I think it, I think the, uh, the pleasure was in the success of, you know, trying to improve, uh, conditions for people. And like I said, it's, uh, you know, it's, a uh, nothing that's cast in stone. Uh, you know, we managed to make amendments to the act to improve it but uh 
in reality, it's up to people like you, Patuk, and other young people uh, who understand the connection between the people and that land and how we might be able to keep it long into the future, you know, uh, because, you know, if you have something of value, there's somebody out there going to try to get it, you know, so thank you. So true. Okay, I want to say koinakpak, and as you could tell, Willie, you said there's lots of great questions in the chat, and so I'm thinking we need to have another discussion like this to answer all those questions. I'm sorry we didn't have more time to get to no, all those questions. No, no. You need to take my class. That's yes. what you got to do. Take my. <laughs> That's what my dad told me to. My dad I got. I got a market. Yes. My dad sucked me and said, "Take Willie's class. You're gonna learn so much." And yes. every time I talk to him, I learn a lot. So yes, Willie, your class is with UAA, right? It's like a two-day thing. Yeah. Or so it it's a it's a three weekender. Oh, three week, uh, three weekends. Yeah, it's a, it's a graduate class, but uh, I take uh, undergraduates uh, if I give them a waiver. But uh, anyway, uh, it's not strictly about land claims. It's actually it includes a lot more. Uh, we but, should promote that on our social media, media guys. AHS. Let's. Yeah. Um, uh, Willie, let's what's the that. name of the class? It's called Alaska Policy Frontiers. Okay. Uh, and it's in, in the College of Business and Public Policy. Uh, okay. But actually, Oliver has helped me with a short course I've done, and I'm going to do it next semester. It's called uh, Traditional Values in the Modern Native Corporation. Okay. And the inspiration of that was Oliver and their experience uh, in getting ASRC going uh, back in the early days when a lot of the leaders were the ones with respect, the, the hunters, right? The whale hunters. And, and they had to somehow figure a way through uh, between the corporate world and the traditional world. And so we have, you know, uh, that sort of discussion from other communities and even villages and sometimes tribes. So uh, I, I think it's a lot of fun. Great, and is that a distance? Can people get um, into that course through? Uh, actually last semester, my classes were uh, Zoom. This semester, it's primarily in person, but I think next time it's going to be a choice. You could be either come in person or take it online. Okay, great. And um, this morning, I wanted to mention, well, I don't know if Sam Quito is still on um, or how he would feel about mentioning that um, he's working on a book. So hopefully we will uh, be able to see that someday soon about his experiences. So, um, I know we've run way over and I said we could go for hours more. <laughs> so um, the next session is supposed to start at 3.30. Uh, so come back when you can. Right now we'll just, I'll end this session and we'll um, take a little break. Yeah, and we'll, uh, we'll share information about your class really maybe on our website. 